<laughs> She's got a mind of her own. <laughs> Good morning, Legacy Church. It is so great to have you in the house of the Lord today. We're in the house of the Lord, and we are the house of the Lord. We would love for you to stand and worship with us this morning. to be in the house of the Lord and to be the house of the Lord. We're so glad to worship with you this morning and worship a God who has always been there. He will always be there. He is there. And he's our God. And the evidence shows that he is real and that he loves us and that he redeemed us. Praise the Lord for that. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you are. 
for all that you do. God, we thank you for your love for us. It's precious and it's invaluable. We thank you for that. God, we just pray that you, we, we ask you to move in our lives. Lord, don't let us be the same that we were yesterday. God, let us be closer to you. Let us be more today than we were yesterday. And God, we continue to ask for tomorrow to be even more. God, we love you. We praise you in your name. Amen. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from good. You guys can have a seat if you like. He's so good. I am excited to share just a couple of announcements with you guys today. The first one is lend a hand is coming up. So we definitely would love to lend as many hands as we can. Um, that information's on the screen. It's going to be September 25th. You'll meet here at 830 
And we're just going to bless some people. You know, we're going to share that evidence and bless people and help them in ways that they can't help themselves. So come join us for Lend a Hand. And then the second thing I'd love to share with you today, upcoming, we have a youth fall retreat coming up, a full day event on October 9th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yep, I hear that. It's going to be a great time. Make sure you've registered, okay? Yes, youth, I'm talking to y'all. Make sure you're registered for that event. It's going to be fantastic, and you don't want to miss it. As we continue to worship today, I just want to tell you that God is real. God is real, and he's working in our lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for all that you've done for us. Lord, we just saying that we believe your evidence is all around us and, and that we believe you're working in our lives. Lord, help us to put that not only in our mouths, but God, in our minds and in our hearts. God, we know that you're good. We know that you're working. Lord, give us the faith to follow you no matter where it leads. God, give us the comfort to know that no matter what our situation is, we're right where you have us for a purpose. God, we love you. We trust you. And we thank you in your name. Amen. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at
like to invite all of our students, fifth grade and under, to exit out to the lobby for our children's church. Good morning, everyone. I always have to check the the stand to make sure I don't leave my last page of notes in there. Uh, Maybe some of you might wish I would. Stop when you run out of notes, right? It's so good to be with you today. You know, I'm really thinking about the things that were important to me growing up. I really, really wanted to milk cows, and uh, I helped. I was with my dad, and the day that all started to happen and I got to milk cows by myself, that was just a fulfillment of something great. And uh, I was just a little kid. You know, what is it that you really want? What is it that you really, you desire, and it's preoccupied, preoccupies your mind, you just can't stop thinking about it? Is there anything like that at all? I would venture to say there is. And what we want to talk about today is that God, in his infinite existence, wants to be God in your life. The fact is, I believe that the truth is, is that God is God, and he is who he says he is, and he will be God. If you believe the Bible, the Bible says that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of who? God the Father. And so I want to share with you today a concept that if we don't give God his rightful place, that we're going to struggle with some things, not only here on this earth, but getting into eternity with him. In Exodus chapter 20, Verse 2, we find Moses unfolding the Ten Commandments. Now, when did this actually happen? Well, actually, about three months after Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea, Moses was called upon to receive these Ten Commandments from God up on Mount Sinai. And so he received these Ten Commandments. And I want to read you one of those commandments this morning. Let's, let's look at it together. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. So the first thing God wanted to do is set his position. Look, I'm the one. I'm the one that, that freed you. I'm the one that gave Moses the power to say, hey, Pharaoh, if you don't let my people go, these plagues are going to happen. I'm the one. I, I'm the one that made that happen. You're now out of slavery You're not getting beaten. You're not getting abused. You are here today because of me. Verse 3, you must not have any other God before me. Now, must not's pretty, pretty strong. You must not. 
Verse 4, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. Not even needing to, wanting as a child to make, to milk cows. <laughs> or for you to be successful, or for you to have the things you want or think you need. Not anything like that. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. Why? Well, because God says, I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. Now this, nothing has changed, my friends. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he declared this to Moses. Moses uh, wrote them on the Ten Commandments. God had to write them down again for him on the, on the stone after he smashed them, but that's a whole other story. The Ten Commandments that were put in the Ark of the Covenant, those have never changed. And today, because God never changes, it's the same. I'm a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. And here's the deal. And here's the D6 part of this whole thing. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. So today, as you think about it, if you're older here, if you're a senior or you're a, a grandparent or a great-grandparent or, or a parent, understand this, that where you place God in your life will have an influence upon your children. Let's say you don't have any children. Everything you do, everything you say, every way you behave will have an impact on the generations to come because people are watching you. Children watch adults. How do children learn to pray? They learn from adults. They learn, hopefully, from their parents and grandparents. How do they learn to be honest? How do they learn the things of God? They're taught by older folks and, hopefully, parents and grandparents. Look at this. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generation, generations of those who reject me. So today I want to submit to you that where you put God in your life, what you demonstrate, what you live out in your life is going to be passed on to future generations. You know, when I was shaving, my, my sons, when they were tiny, they wanted to get some kind of a little apparatus and they wanted to shave too. So I put a little, little shaving cream on their face and they let them, let them scrape it off. That's how they learned to shave, right? People learn about your children, the, the younger generation, our youth, and our children of today, adults. They look at you and they say, well, where are the adults putting God in their lives? God will not take second place. He will not tolerate it. It's against the character of who he is. Now, Patrick Mabelog, in an article in Christianity Today, says that some areas in our lives that could possibly become God's are these. If we're not aware and we don't exercise great care, these things can come ahead of God. And I gave you a humorous example of me wanting to milk cows. I had that in my mind. I wanted to be the one to put the machine on the cow. I wanted to be able to dump the milk. I wanted to be able to do that. It became almost an obsession to me. I don't know why. I just lived on the farm. I thought it was cool that my dad knew how to do all that stuff. And I watched him and I learned. And by the time I was eight, nine years old, I could do that myself. But... I wonder sometime, was I thinking more about milking cows than I was about my relationship with God? Because that's about the time I accepted Jesus as my Savior. So here are some of the things that could possibly take the place of your pursuit of putting God where he belongs. Work, success, phone, or any other electronic device. I was, oh, that was so timely. Somebody's chime went off. I love that. I should pay you for that. And they said, okay, come. Any other electronic device, I mean, the first thing you grab, there's a popular concept that's just starting to emerge right now in Christendom, God before phone. What the challenge is out there today is that we would, <clears throat> we would actually grab our Bible before we grab our phone in the morning. Huh, oh, wow. So phone or any other electronic device, Becoming your God if you give too much attention to it. Image. 
how you look to other people, Facebook, Instagram, wanting to make sure that people see the image you want to portray that could easily become a God. It could come before God. Materialism, wanting things, wanting what you want could easily become a God, Patrick says in his article. Sensuality, thinking about things that satisfy our baser desires and becoming possessed with that and that taking the place of a vital relationship with God. The pursuit of money. I need to have things. I need to have money. They're just people that, that they just love money. And if they can gain more money, then they're satisfied. They like that. They like the pursuit of more money. And even the management of money can become a God. Again, I just want to say that God will not tolerate second place. It's against the character of who he is. Now, let's talk about character for a second. You know, God is talking here in the Ten Commandments, hey, I'm the Lord your God who took you out of slavery. That's a practical thing. That's a logical thing. Okay, God's the one that supplied the power. He's the one that led them out of slavery. He's the one that parted the Red Sea. Yes, he used people and the Moses' staff and all of that, but he was the one that provided the power. Okay, we can kind of, kind of logically define that just a little bit. But then when he said, you must not have any other God before me, he began to get into concept. Now, he talked about people would make idols and they would make big statues and they would bow down and they would worship those things. But it wasn't the statue or, or the God itself that they were worshiping. It was the concept of, hey, man, I just need something. I need something to, to pour my heart out to. And today, same thing. Where is our heart? The Bible says where our treasure is, there our heart is also. So where is your treasure? The treasure of your time the treasure of your finances, the treasure of your talent, your vital energy, where does it go? So the character of God is simply this. He needs to be supreme. Now in YWAM, Youth at the Mission, uh, our son and daughter-in-law were with them for 18 years, and they would send us nuggets. And one of the, the nuggets that we learned from them was all about the character of God, learning the character of God. See, one of the characteristics of God is that he yearns for every human being to be his child. And so that's kind of the basis of YWAM, Youth of the Mission, why they have 50,000 missionaries with feet on the ground in, in almost every country that you can think of especially in the 1040 window. And so their goal was, because God wants to draw all men to him, their goal was to get the message of Jesus Christ to everyone so they could connect with God. So his character, as defined by their discipleship training school, was this, and I wrote this down, three lines. By character, God is loving, he's just, he's holy, wise, gracious, compassionate, Merciful, kind, forgiving, long-suffering, slow to anger, faithful, and more. You see, his character is defined in the Old Testament. When we say the phrase or the, the two words, God's word, what does that literally mean? That literally means that the things that are written on the pages of the Old Testament and the New Testament are literally words that came from God. Now, in the Old Testament, a lot came through prophets and scribes. God would give these words. In fact, the definition of a prophet is one who speaks the very words of God. And so these scribes put this down on paper so we could understand the character of God. And here he says in this passage today, he's a jealous God. He won't have any other gods before. It won't work. So if you have things in your life that you're pursuing that are ahead of God in your pursuit of him being preeminent in your life, it's not going to work. Now, I want to share a favorite story. I gave you a little bit of twinkling of it a few weeks ago if you were here or happened to listen online. I told you I would talk some more about this magnificent story found in 1 Samuel 5. Now, the Israelites, as you know, they constantly all through the Old Testament had enemies people who didn't worship the true God, the Jehovah God. They worshiped idols. They were given over to material things. They were all about uh, sensuality and all these kind of things. And they would worship those acts and the symbols of those acts. One of those, act, one of those symbols was a God called Dagon. 
And so they would worship this Dagon and they would make statues of him, make a huge statue and build a temple for him and put him in a temple. Now look what happens. The Philistines were one of the Israelites' arch enemies and they wanted to take the Israelites down and occupy their property and take them over and make them their slaves. So in one of the times when the Israelites weren't working, weren't walking with God, they weren't allowing God to be preeminent in, in their lives. They were straying away, worshiping other gods. During one of those times, God allowed their enemies to defeat them and kill literally tens of thousands of Israelites because God was not able to bless them in their disobedience. And so we find what happens is the Philistines have defeated the armies of Israel and they've captured the Ark of God. Now, the Ark of God was the symbol of God's presence with his people. And you've heard me say this before, if you've um, been under my teaching at all, that within the Ark of God was the Ten Commandments. Nothing else was in there, the Ten Commandments. That was the Word of God. Those were the, the, um, the behavioral things that God said you must do to remain my people. So here, the Philistines have now captured this Ark, with the Ten Commandments representing the presence of God. After they captured the Ark of God, 1 Samuel 5, 1, they took it from the battleground at Ebenezer, where they had just shellacked the Israelites big time, to the town of Ashdod. They carried the Ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. Check out this story. This is phenomenal. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the ark of the Lord. By the way, all gods will be subservient or subservient to God, if not now, someday. And someday you will see him in all of his glory. And he will be interested in what you did with him. So they took Dagon and put him in his place again. Verse 4, but the next morning, the same thing happened. Why is that? Because the character of God is there will be no other gods before him, whether in his life or in your life or in a person's life or in, in a situation like this. Nothing's going to be standing over the ark of God. He is the supreme presence. Dagon had fallen face down before the ark of the Lord again. This time, his head and hands had broken off and were lying in the doorway. Only the trunk of his body was left intact. Now, it's interesting. Nobody was in there to do that. You catching this? God can deal with inanimate objects if he wants to. He can do whatever he wants. He's God. That is why to this day neither the priest of Dagon nor anyone who enters the temple of Dagon and Ashdod will step on its threshold. Then the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashdod and the nearby villages with the plague of tumors. When the people realized what was happening, they cried out. They started to recognize that they can't have any gods before the one true God and they were a people of gods, small g. When they realized, they said, we can't keep the ark of God of Israel with us any longer. He is against us. Now let's understand this. He was against them because they put somebody or something else, some other kind of image ahead of God. It's the same for us today. God is for us, not against us. We sing it in a worship song. However, what's going to happen is you're going to have the, the just nature the judgment of God upon you if you decide, hey, I'll worship God some, but I want to worship this over here. I want to put this before God. You're going to have the heavy hand of God upon you, and you will understand that God also will have justice. That's part of his character. So here's what happens. We can't keep the ark of God here with us. He's against us. We will all be destroyed along with Dagon, our God. So they called together the rulers of the Philistine towns and asked, what should we do with the ark of God of Israel? The rulers discussed it and replied, move it to another town. 
Now, it's interesting, they still wanted to keep it within Philistine rule. They still wanted to keep it away from the Israelites because they knew it brought power to the Israelites, especially when the Israelites were walking in obedience. And so they said, well, let's take it over to Gath. Sort of like, you know, when you play the neighboring school, right? You want to destroy them? Yeah, those Gath folks. Suppose they called them Gathites, I don't know. Move it to the town of Gath. So they moved the ark of God of Israel to Gath. Look at this. When the ark arrived at Gath, the Lord's heavy hand fell upon its men, young and old, and he struck them with a plague of tumors, and there was great panic. So they sent the ark of God to the town of Ekron. But when the people of Ekron saw it coming, they had heard what happened in, Dag- in, in, uh, in um, Ashdod. They heard what happened in Gath. They didn't want any part of that ark coming. So they cried out. They're bringing the ark of God of Israel here to kill us too. The people summoned the Philistine rulers again and begged them, please send the ark of God, (laughs) ark of Israel, back to its own country or it will kill us all. Are you catching the gravity of who God is right now? I mean, I think... I think we just take this so lightly. Those of us who are believers already in Jesus Christ, we kind of go, well, wow, we're saved. We have eternal life. Our name is written in the book of life so that if I wander off and I get off track and I don't give God first place, he's going to be all right with that. He always takes us back. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and he'll do it again and he'll do it again. And while that's true, we forget the words of Jesus that I repeat often. I I repeat them because I need to hear them as much as anyone else. If anyone comes after me, Let him first deny himself. That means your own agenda becomes subservient to God's word. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know what's interesting? When you take on the yoke and the burden of putting God first, that's not heavy. His burdens are not heavy. They're light. Because what happens is if you walk in him, with him as your God, he makes your way smooth. So a mega theme through the Bible, he will make your path smooth. Now, he doesn't say you won't have troubles, but you won't be stumbling over the rocks of your own sin and your own decision to have other gods in your life. You'll have a smooth path that will be fraught with other stuff. You're going to have stuff. Jesus even said that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about my grace is sufficient. Sometimes he calms a storm. Sometimes he calms the child. But either way, he will keep you calm and he will walk with you if you keep him as your God. Well, even before they got to Ekron, the deadly plague from God had already begun there and great fear was sweeping across that town. And those who didn't die were afflicted with tumors and then the cry from town rose to heaven. You know what happened? They took the the ark back. (laughs) They, They just, you know, no one can stand you know, just uh, as our worship team sang, you, you, can't, you can't even fathom the power of God. No one can stand up against the power of God. Now, you can do it for a temporary time if you feel like you want to take that chance right now. But I would su- suggest not. With all the things that are frightening people, with all the fear that's there, God is saying to you right now, fear not. Fear not for anything. I am going to provide for you. I will have my hand on you. I will protect you. You are my own. Why should, I God, why should I give God first place in my life? You only can have one answer. You can only have one answer, why you should. Because he's God. And if you want to serve something less powerful, if you want to serve something and have your own way and all of that, then you will lack the power of God, the supreme power. And unfortunately, you can't serve two gods. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. This is Jesus. In his most significant sermon, it's one of his longest sermons, it's called Sermon on the Mount. You've heard me say it many times if you've been around uh, this at all. And if you're brand new, I want to tell you this. Every month you should read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 again. Wouldn't hurt for you to do it every day for a week, once a month. 90% of how we should live and our understanding about our daily existence is found from the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And then read the rest of the Bible the rest of the time. 
God, Jesus, in God's word says this, no one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's the same with anything else. Maybe money's not your God, maybe image, maybe time spent on gaming, maybe things that are just taking your time and you're not, you're not putting God first. And then you have to remember that it's not just about you. If you're young today, if you're sixth grade and older and you're sitting here because this is where you are now that you're not uh, back in Treasure Town for, for children's ministries, if you're young and you're saying, man, I got plenty of time, you know what? People are watching you. Younger kids are watching you because they think you're cool. And so today, remember the creator, the Bible says, in the days of your youth. Here's the deal. Put God first. Other people are watching. Teacher and pastor David Ward from Colorado told this illustration about Rain Man. Some of you may remember or have seen the movie Rain Man. Actually, in 1988, it was the top money-making film. It also won the Oscar for Best Picture. It tells the story of a selfish, abrasive, kind of wheeler dealer named Charlie, played by Tom Cruise. Boy, he looked really young. If you want to see how young he looks, just look at a snippet of that. Tom Cruise played Charlie. Now, Charlie discovered that his, he was not in a good frame with his, with his dad. When his dad died, what happened is he found out he actually had a brother named Raymond, played by Dustin Hoffman. And then he discovered, when they read the will, that his dad had left all of his fortune, let me see, I wrote down a multi-million dollar estate in this movie, to Raymond. Raymond had autism. He was a savant. He was a genius guy, but he, he was autistic. And so in his mind, the most important things to him as he grew older were apple juice, Cheetos, and watching the people's court on TV. <laughs> and those were the most important things. You see, you see, Raymond didn't understand he had inherited a fortune. It didn't matter to him. The things that were important were just some of those simple things, but yet they were like a god to him. He didn't understand he had an enormous inher inheritance, and he didn't live like it either. Now, fortunately, as their relationship developed toward the end, Charlie, the wheeler dealer, the Tom Cruise guy, began to realize that he cared about his brother, and it wasn't just about the money, and it, it kind of had kind of a happy ending. But here's what happens to us. How many of us, lacking spiritual awareness about who God is, don't put him in first place and, and, and don't realize that he has prepared an incredible inheritance for us. It's all ours. The Bible teaches that, that everything that Christ has as the Son of God is also ours. We are fellow heirs to the throne. It's, it's also ours. God has prepared for us that unimaginable inheritance and promises today to provide for your every need. But we operate as if we don't even know about the inheritance. We don't, do we have an inheritance? We're like Raymond. We're like Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. It's like, uh, well, I, I need to get my apple juice. I need to make sure I have my Cheetos. And I need to make sure that I don't miss people's court. Friends, the politics of our nation, the things of COVID, the cultural things that are going on, everything that comes and presses in on us and brings fear and concern can all be melted into a dim phase and the things of earth will grow strangely dim if you'll turn your eyes upon Jesus. Yes, those things exist. Yes, we must be, we must be in prayer. Yes, we must be light in dark places. We must shine in dark places. That is our job. But we can only do that effectively if God is first in our lives. If we're possessed by the news, if we're possessed by gluttony for our stomach. I'll, I'll tell you this. I have struggled with gluttony my whole adult life. I want to I wanna have my food, and I want to eat a little bit more of it than I should. 
and I constantly struggle with it, and it's, it's a war. I'm just being transparent with you. It's a war. You know, Tammy's tried to help me over the years. My wife, if you're watching online, you don't know who Tammy is. She's my wife, and, and, and she has discipline when it comes to food. I don't. And so she would try to help me years ago, and she found out that didn't work because I just got mad. Why did I get mad? Because I knew it was true. She'd say, are you sure you want to take that second helping? You sure you need a full rack of ribs instead of a half? I look at her and I say, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> what? I mean, you know, so I'm a 40 waist. My point is, is that anything that takes you away from God, that, that man, I've got to have, I mean, i got to have food. i got to get to my phone. i got to text. i gotta, I got to get on Facebook. I have to make sure people know what I'm doing, and, and, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. Friends, I have to be worried about, about things that, that are going on in this world. You know what? It can become a God, and it can come ahead of him being first place in your life. God will be first place or he will be nothing at all. To be second just isn't in his character. A turtle and a scorpion, this is a popular fable, has been told, probably originated in Persia, but there's lots of derivatives of it. I'll just tell you a short version of it. A turtle and a scorpion were friends, old friends. One day, the scorpion had a need to get across the river. Now, ordinarily, he could skip. He could find a, a place where the rocks were strategically placed so he could skip from rock to rock to get across to the other side. But the river had swollen with the flood, and he needed to get across the river. So he asked the turtle, can I climb on your back, and can, I sw can you swim me across the river to the other side? And uh, what do friends do? Of course, I can do that. And so the turtle says, sure, climb on. He gets to the other side, and just as the Scorpion is ready to climb off his shell. The scorpion wallops him with his stinger. Fortunately for the turtle, he withstood it and survived because it hit his shell and it repelled the majority of the poison. He looked at the scorpion and he said, probably not in these words in the old fable, but he said, dude, I'm your friend. I just did you a favor. I got you across the floodwaters to the other side, which you asked me to do. Why is it that you stung me even so? And the scorpion looked at him and said, I just had the urge to sting. See, it is the character of a scorpion to sting. He can't help himself. My friends, when Jesus Christ comes into your life and you have the Holy Spirit guiding you and leading you, it changes your character because it changes your master. The Bible says that if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Sin is no longer your master. There's a new sheriff in town, and it's God. And so Jesus wants to stay God in your life and change your character character. Now, you'll always fight the sin nature. Paul wrote about that in Romans, and he, he, it's a great book to study. But I'll tell you this, my friends. Your character can become the character of God if you dwell on him. But there's some things you need to do. If you're going to give him first place in your life, you need to focus on him. He needs to be priority. You need to do something every day to connect him. The same broken record is here from almost every, song, every sermon. You need to get in his word. You need to put God before phone. You need to put God before everything because he won't have second place. I encourage you, give it a shot. In the morning, man, I have got to go straight to the word or I'm in trouble the rest of the day. Sometimes I didn't get to bed or I'm tired and I, I, just, I just hurry up and get ready and come to church and start working on stuff. Yeah, I might be in the Bible preparing for the sermon, but it's not the same as connecting with God personally and saying, God, today, you're first even before my job. You're first. The Bible before anything. God's word before anything. Give it a shot. God, thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, that you told us very implicitly, hey, I need to have first place here. There should be no other gods before me. We know, God, you never change, and so you haven't changed. And so we trust you in that. 
And Lord, we need your help to obey. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in us, Christ in us, to put you first. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, would you help us do that? And help us celebrate every day that you come before everything else. And we'll not forget to praise you for giving us the ability and the tools to do just that. In Christ's name, amen. What do you want most? If you're honest with yourself, what do you want the most? For some of us, it's physical healing. For some of us, it's financial stability. For some people, it's a home that is safe. All very good things. What do you want the most? As you think about that, Think about the words you've heard today. If your heart's been pricked that you realize what you want the most and you realize it's not God, but you're his child, he's speaking to you. He's reaching out his hand to you saying, I forgive you. I love you. You're precious to me, but put me first. You are my child. I have freed you from the bondage of of sin. You are not a slave. Choose me first. Want me more than anything else that you want. He's speaking to us today. He's speaking to me today. We need to hunger and thirst after him more than we want anything else in this world. If your heart has been pricked, know that he's loving and forgiving and you are his child. He wants to elevate you to the next step. He wants to elevate you to be closer to him. He wants to be the center of all in your life. So as you reflect on what you want the most, let us be aware and ask God for his help to desire him more than that. You are his children. We are his children. He's not going to forsake us. Let's choose him first today.
we have heard the word today, let us be blessed. Let us know that our Father loves us more than anything, and he always chooses us first. And I ask this blessing for you that throughout this week and the rest of your days, that you continue to choose him first and receive that blessing. We love you. We're so glad we got to worship with you today, and we'll see you again next week.